Hello and welcome to Creative Thursdays. My name is Jessica Arsenault and I'll be your host for this event. I'm a Settler Canadian and I work in the Learning and Community Engagement team at the National Gallery of Canada. As we begin this event, I want to acknowledge that the National Gallery is located on the unceded and unsurrendered lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, who have been the guardians of this territory since time immemorial, in the present and for the future. As tonight we're meeting virtually and we're coming from different territories, I encourage each of us to learn more about the land on which we are and our responsibilities to it so that we can take action in good ways. Tonight's event will take place in four parts. First, a short introduction to the event by me. Then artist Alex Antol will present the setup and tools required for today's workshop. While you prepare your space, my colleague Alexia will share an artwork from the Ancestors Gallery. And finally, we'll spend the rest of the session with Alex Antol in a beating workshop. A few notes before I pass it to the artist. This workshop will take place in English. If you're interested in following a French beating workshop, the event will take place later today and will be available on our YouTube channel in the following weeks. Cet atelier se déroulera en anglais. L'atelier en français aura lieu plus tard aujourd'hui et sera disponible sur notre chaîne YouTube dans les prochaines semaines si vous n'avez pas eu la chance d'y assister. This talk is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Throughout the evening, you're invited to communicate your questions and comments with us by using the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your screen. And if anyone is experiencing technical difficulties with their connection to Zoom or audiovisual settings during the event, please contact Connected Canadians toll-free at 1-877-304-5813. I would now like to present artist Alex Antel. Alex Antel is an Ilnu multidisciplinary artist who lives and works in El Mastuguek Udahamkuk Bay of Islands, Newfoundland. She practices slow stitching, including beadwork and caribou tufting. Alex's work explores the relationship between traditions and modern Mi'kmaq people, living culture, and the importance of land and water. Welcome, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, you're going to notice that I'm going to have two uh, screens up for the whole workshop. Uh, so you're going to be able to see me, um, and you're also going to be able to see uh, my mat and what I'm working on. Uh, so at this point, I'm just going to help us get ready and show you what you're going to need for the workshop. So the first thing that you're going to need is two different colors of seed beads. Um, so I'm using green and white, and I'm using size 10, but you can use any size and any combination of colors. Uh, you're going to need a small piece of stiffened beading felt. Uh, now, this can be left out if you don't have it, uh, so it's not 100% necessary, but it does make it a little bit easier, uh, and it makes your piece a little bit stiffer as well. Uh, you're going to have two pieces of hide, uh, so I'm using moose hide that's like suede on both sides. Uh, it's easiest to use something that's a bit thin, because uh, you're going to have to put a needle through it many times, uh, and on one of the pieces I have a little flower drawn out on it. You're going to need some uh, beading thread. I'm using white, but whatever colors, whatever color of thread goes with your beads is fine to use. Um, you're going to need a pin. Now it's best if you can use one of the flat back pins, um, but it's hard to get items in Newfoundland sometimes. So I'm using what I've got um, and some scissors just for cutting your thread. Uh, and you'll need two needles. Now I'm gonna be using um, size nine Glover needles. Um, you can also use like size 11 beading needles, um, as long as your beads can fit over your needle and your needle can go through your leather, you should be good to go. Uh, and I'm also gonna be using a thimble for my finger. Um, just because working with leather can be a bit hard on your fingers. Um, so I'm gonna use a thimble, um, but if you don't have one, again, no big deal. Um, so I also have some leather cutting scissors here. Um, we are gonna have to trim around um, our flower and we're gonna have to cut out a back 
um, board as well. So a smaller piece. Um, but if you just have one pair of scissors, um, it's all good. Sometimes I cut leather with these. It's not the smartest thing to do, but sometimes you gotta use what you got. Uh, and the last thing is sometimes I like to use um, beeswax for my thread just to make it a little bit stronger and makes it not fray as easily. Um, but yeah, that's everything you need. And so just get everything out on your mats and pour your beads out uh, and we're good to go. Thank you so much, Alex. So while you're setting up your space uh, at home, I'm gonna welcome my colleague, Alexia, interpreter at the gallery, We'll share an artwork from the Ancestors Gallery as you get your space and materials ready for Alex's workshop. At the National Gallery of Canada's presentation of Uninvited, Canadian Women Artists in the Modern Movement, a complementary initiative was created by the Department of Indigenous Ways and Decolonization called the Ancestors Gallery. In this gallery, seven ancestral artworks were selected from the many regions represented in the gallery's collection of historical Indigenous art. These seven ancestors are being researched by Indigenous art specialists, and the artwork we will be learning about tonight is one of these seven works. So welcome, Alexia. Hi, thank you. So, since our featured artist, Alex Antle, has some Mi'kmaq heritage, we chose to feature a Mi'kmaq artwork from our exhibition, Uninvited. What we see here is called a beaded peaked cap and it was created by a once known Mi'kmaq woman in the 19th century, roughly around 1830. It is made of wool, silk, glass beads, and thread, and it comes from the Maritimes, specifically from the region of Nova Scotia. The fine beadwork and ribbon inlay of the cap illustrates the preciousness of this object to the wearer and maker. We do not know the name of the maker of this cap, which is why we say it was made by a once known Mi'kmaq artist. So what do I mean when I say the word once known when referencing historical indigenous artwork? Well, in the past, details about indigenous makers and artists were not recorded because of the ways that these works were collected. Ethnographers would collect, purchase, sometimes unfortunately loot items as remnants of what they believed was a dying culture, which could not be further from the truth. Some objects would be purchased at souvenir stands, others would simply be taken inconspicuously from their communities of origin, and a lot of the time only the location of the object was recorded, rather than its maker or nation. When referencing the maker of these objects as once known rather than unknown, it humanizes the artist and recognizes that such information is missing and is currently being researched. This peaked cap is a beautiful example of Indigenous women's dress from the 19th century and offers a glimpse into early Indigenous styles that have endured to now inspire contemporary Mi'kmaq designs. Beaded peaked caps were popular among Mi'kmaq women during the post-contact period, and they were most popular during the late, ninth, no, the late 18th century. It's hard to say with certainty if these caps were worn before contact with Europeans and settlers, but by the 19th century, peaked caps were important status symbols that were both made and worn by Mi'kmaq women as they came of age. The darker colored caps, such as the one we have here, were closely associated with older women, whereas younger women typically wore red colored caps that were given to them as they entered womanhood. The hoods would not only protect their head from the sun, cold and insects, they also held social and spiritual significance and were likely important articles of formal and ceremonial dress. Although there's a lot of mystery surrounding the origins of the beaded hood, it is likely that this type of garb is a reiteration of another older traditional hood that was perhaps made of animal hide or bark and ornamented with moose hair or porcupine quills. When came the arrival of trade materials such as wool, cloth, silk ribbon, and glass beads, it produced this version of the cap. In general, women's caps would share some broad commonalities such as having similar shape, beadwork, and silk ribbon applique, but each hood was entirely unique in its ornamentation and detailing. The care in the construction, as well as the time dedicated to creating such an elaborate piece, demonstrates the importance of these hoods for the Mi'kmaq women who made and wore these items. Over time, each owner would add designs relevant to the knowledge and power she gained as she aged. They would bead and reference plants that they would use for food or medicine, or they would describe their relationship to the earth as the seasons passed. Overall, 
Each beaded cap gives us a memory of the woman who wore it and designed it as an extension of herself. And that concludes our featured artwork segment. Back to you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Alexia. So I now welcome Alex Antol again for the workshop. If you have questions for Alex, I invite you to put them in the Q&A box and I'll bring them up uh, with uh, the artist when the time comes. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, yes, and I strongly encourage anyone to ask questions as we're going through if you want uh, clarification. And I did notice that someone had typed in asking uh, what type of thread I'm using. Uh, and so I'm just using uh, beading thread. Uh, sometimes you can choose a size um, and usually I'll go with size D, uh, but most of the time when you're buying beading thread, uh, it's just called beading thread. Um, there's not usually very many options there. Uh, awesome. So um, as we get started, um, the first thing that we're going to need is our one piece of leather that has a little flower drawn on it. Um, and you can also draw a flower or whatever shape you'd like to use uh, onto parchment paper and lay it on top and then tear it off after. Uh, because I'm using pretty big beads, um, I just used a really thin uh, pen to draw around it. Um, and so it'll all be covered up. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start with our thread. And so I've already cut mine off, um, but what you're gonna do is we need two pieces of thread. So I usually um, just take it off and then I'll do the length of both of my hands apart. So I'll hold this in one hand and take off a piece in the other hand and just pull until my arms are as far apart as they can go. And so for our first thread, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the needle and we're going to thread it and we're gonna put our needle halfway down uh, the piece of thread so that we've got two even pieces of thread coming out from the needle. And then we're gonna tie those two pieces together at the end. So basically we've got a giant loop here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna place our uh, leather that we're working with on top of our little piece of stiffened beading felt. Uh, and again, it's really no big deal if you don't have a piece of stiffened beading felt. I just find that it makes, um, makes everything a little bit sturdier. So what we're going to do is we're going to poke up, poke up our needle from the back and we're going to find the middle. So if you don't do it right in the middle, that's fine. Take it out, move it over, and then we're gonna pull it all the way through. And so as we go forward, I'm gonna refer to this as our double thread. And that just means that it's the thread that's got two, it's like folded in half. Cause we're not gonna do that with our other piece of thread. Okay, so right now we should just have one piece of thread coming up from the bottom there. Uh, and so the colors that I'm going to do is a little bit of white in the middle and then some green all the way around. Uh, so I'm just going to take one bead right now. So our first row is super easy. We slide on one bead, put it down to the bottom, and then we're just going to put our needle down through about a bead's length away and pull it all the way down. So then we've just got one bead in the middle there. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna build this little second row around here. So we're gonna come up using the same double thread. We're gonna come up on the side right there not touching the bead, but pretty close. So then you pull all that thread out. And then I found that seven is the number of beads that I usually had to put around. Um, it could be a little bit of trial and error, especially depending on what size beads you're using. Um, but I know that I should probably need seven, um, but it's very easy to take them off afterwards. 
So no worries. So then it's very easy to add and take things off with this type of beading. So with applique beading, you can either do one needle or two needle. Personally, I practice the two needle method. Um, so at this point, we're going to take another thread and needle, and we're gonna use that thread and needle to tack down in between all these beads to make sure everything stays together really tightly. Now, lots of people do use the one needle method where they use this same needle to tack down and to put their beads on. Um, so that's another way to do it. But we're gonna be doing two needle today. So you're gonna to wanna to take your thread and take another piece off about the same length. So about, you know, your whole arm, your whole wingspan. Uh, and we're not gonna double this one up. So we are just gonna take the end of it and if I put it over that, you can see it a little bit better. So we're just gonna take one of the ends and tie a couple knots in it. You probably only need one or two, but I tend to overdo it. <laughs> and then we're going to just thread um, your needle on the other side. And now we're not going to put this one down to the middle, but we are gonna leave a little tail. So a couple, a couple inches there for a tail. Um, so it can sometimes be difficult when you're working with two needles and two threads, but just remember that your double thread, so this one with two, that's the one that you're always putting your beads on. Um, and that's always gonna be on the top. So now hold your beads in place to where you want to tack them down and then take your single thread and you're gonna poke your needle up in between the first two beads. So you're going in between where the two beads are and then pull your thread all the way through. And then the knot you made is gonna hold up on the back. So then we go up on one side and then we go over those beads and we go down on the other side. So essentially we're making a loop over this thread. And then you pull down. Pull it all the way through and give it a good tug. The more you keep all your threads tight, the more tight your beadwork is going to be and the more clean it's going to look. And then so we do the same thing in between the next two beads. Now, when it comes to applique beading, a lot of people will bead every second or third bead. Um, and it's not really necessary to go in between every single bead. That being said, um, I often go in between every single bead and tack down every single one. Um, it will make it more time consuming, but it will also make your bead work a little bit more sturdy. Um, I find especially when you're doing outlines, it's nice to go in between every single bead or even every second bead. Um, and then if you're filling something in, now we're not going to be filling this in today. We're just going to be doing the outline and then we're going to edge around it. But if you were going to fill in here, um, then it would be um, pretty easy to just go every third bead. Um, because when the beads are all pushed together, they're kind of keeping each other in place. Whereas if they're just one row of beads, um, then really tacking it down is the only way to keep it in place. So this form of beading is pretty repetitive. Um, you know, once you, uh, once you get down that tacking down thing, it, it's pretty much the same thing for the rest of the, whatever you're making until you get to the edge. Um, so now when I'm at the end here, this is all the beads I can do. So at this point, you take your needle and you shove it down through the leather and the beading thread again. 
Personally, I find um, it keeps everything a bit more perfect if you go in through the next bead. So this is my last bead here. And then I'm gonna go through the next one and pull it all the way through. And then I'm gonna go down in between um, wherever I came out close to that. And I'm just gonna pull it all the way through. And so this is how we move um, our double thread to a different spot when we wanna start um, beading somewhere else on the leather. So now we've got the little centerpiece done. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna start working on the outline here. So what I do is I do a full petal all the way around, and then I come back up and do kind of like half of the petal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this double thread again, because that's the one that always goes on top. And I'm just gonna push my needle up so that I can um, go straight up in between the petals. So you wanna kind of find that uh, edge there and just go straight down uh, from that. And at this point, I'm gonna start using um, my second color. So I'm gonna be using green. And then I don't really count out the beads. Um, just put on a whole needle's worth because uh, this one is gonna take quite a few beads. So I'll have to uh, add some more as we go. And then I'm just gonna re-thread my single needle because I pulled my needle out on accident. <laughs> Okay, so when I'm going to the next step, this is what it's going to end up looking like. Just one petal all the way around. So the first thing you do is go straight up from the center up to the little dip in between the petals there. So just hold your beads with your thumb and kind of push them forward so that they're going towards the end. And I also try and hold this thread in my hand. so. I'm kind of pulling on this thread in my hand and also pushing the beads forward with my thumb. And then so I do the same thing again where I'm just going up on one side, pull my thread all the way through. I go over the top of those beads and in between. So I'm kind of trying to hide my thread um, and then pull it all the way through and then give it, give it a little tug. And then you just do that all the way around. And especially if this is your first time beading, um, don't worry too much about going in between every single bead. Um, lots of people don't do that. Um, Again, I'm just a little particular about um, the way I bead. So it's perfectly normal to uh, not go in between every single bead because it does add a lot of time. And beading is a pretty uh, time consuming activity anyways. While you're working, Alex, there's a question that could be relevant now. Someone's asking, how do you keep the threads from tangling the double and the single? Yeah, <laughs> that's something that will probably take a bit of getting used to. Um, so what I do is I'm always working with one of the threads. So um, so this double thread that I have here now, I have it kind of like off to my left so that, you know, I, I can grab it when I need it, when I need to push, I need a couple more beads now. So I'll grab them and just put them up. And then I'm always having my other one on my right side. 
Um, things can get a little tricky when you're um, like moving your double thread um, and you can get them kind of tangled uh, or like loop through each other. Um, but really just try and keep them on opposite sides of your mat or your hands. Um, and then when you're uh, moving your double thread, just be very slow with it because you will probably notice, and the issue isn't really with it getting tank or with it, you know, making a loop or something with it. The issue is when you're pulling on it and then it goes tight and then you can't get it out. Um, that being said, with this form of beading, it's extremely easy to um, tie off and add new thread. So um, you can work with really short pieces of thread if that is easier for you. Um, and it's absolutely super easy, no issue um, to add more thread. Because with some forms of beading, it is a little bit more complicated. So like for brick stitch, if you're tying off and adding thread, you need to be going through all your beads again. Not all your beads, but some beads again. Um, and so that can uh, lead to beads breaking um, if you've got too much thread going through it. Uh, but it's not like that with applique. Uh, you can simply just tie your threads at the back and then start new threads the exact same way we did in the first place. So just make your double or single or both um, tie a knot and then just continue um, where, with wherever you left off. So that, that's one of my favorite things about applique actually is that I find it a very forgiving method uh, that if you make mistakes, it's easy to take things back. It's easy to um, add on new thread or restart or whatever you need to do. And if you find that the double thread is really um, difficult to get used to, um, you could also try the single needle method. Um, I think it's really just a personal preference. So for me, I learned two needle applique first. Um, I learned from Nicole Travers, who's an absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal Mi'kmaq beater um, from Lark Harbor in Nomaskabek, the Bay of Islands. Um, and so I think because I learned two needle first, then that's just easier for me. Um, I find with one needle, uh, it's not as perfect, I guess, as I would like it to be. I know nothing's ever perfect, but um, so I shy away from one needle, but um, if you are having issues with your thread, then it's, it's worth giving it a try. There was another question uh, to people were wondering if you could repeat what size of Glover needle you said you were using and what size of beading needle. Yeah, sure. So I'm using size nine Glover needles. Um, so that's pretty small. And the reason that I'm using those is because I need the beads to fit over it. Um, so you don't often use Glover needles for beading, um, but because I'm going over the leather, um, it is easier to do that. So size nine for Glover needles, I have size seven and the beads don't fit over them. So size nine would be probably the biggest that you could use. I don't even know if there's smaller Glover needles than size nine. Um, and then for beading needles, I've used um, size 11, but um, I would probably just, it depends on the size of beads you're using. Um, but I would use the biggest needle possible as long as the beads fit on. So if you're using size 15 beads, that's gonna be different um, than if you're using size uh, 10 or 11. So as you can tell, it's um, like a pretty repetitive process. Um, that's why we call it slow stitching. 
Um, but I have things um, ready at different stages. So what I can do is skip ahead and show you um, what we'll do when this pedal is done. So there's another question um, about what type of leather you are using. Um, also, in relation to that question, um, a question about moose hide, that um, this person has moose hide, but it's very thick and is wondering if you have a very thick hide, would you need to stretch it out? Or is there another use that's more appropriate for thicker letters? For thicker, for thicker leather. Yeah, so for for this, I use like the thinnest leather that I can get. Um, if you have thicker leather, what you could do is just use um, like a bigger globber needle and use a larger size of beads. Um, that being said, that is a little bit more difficult or if you want to do something detailed, um, like that, that would be kind of hard. Um, so there are some workarounds. So if you did want to use the thicker leather for um, like something with smaller beads, I sometimes, I did um, a really large beaded um, watershed map of the Exploits River. And it was a thicker leather because it was such a big piece. I didn't want it to be too flimsy. Um, so what I did was I used um, I used a couple different sizes of needles, but I did some, sometimes use size nine. And what I would do is I would make sure that I have a thimble on my finger. So I'm using a leather one, uh, but you can use any kind of thimble. Um, and then I would like poke it up. And then I would use a pair of pliers to pull it through because um, it, it will be difficult to pull through. Um, but that, that will make it a lot more time consuming, <laughs> um, for, for other things to do with, uh, with thicker, um, leather, you could just do something that doesn't have work on it. So, you know, making like a drum bag or, um, like mittens or moccasins or something that doesn't have any beading on it then you can use a large glover needle and then it would be a lot easier to work with. Um, so yeah, just depends on what you're, what you're looking to do with it. But um, if you're making something that's like relatively small, um, the, the thinner leather is uh, more than enough. So you just work your way all the way down back to this little white area in the middle. And so what I'm gonna do is just um, put that one aside. And I've got one here that has um, this whole um, petal finished. So when you get to the end here, your double thread is going to be on top. So I don't tack down my last one because I'm going to be um, putting the needle through anyways. So when you get here, what you want to do is take this double needle that should already be on top. Uh, and I'm going to put it, make sure that my beads are in alignment. And then I'm going to put my needle down as close to that bead as possible so that I'm hiding my thread and also so that I'm making sure that I'm not making this last bead go wonky. So if I try to put my needle down over here, I'm kind of going to pull that petal around. Um, so I want it to be kind of perfectly aligned with um, the shape it was already taking and just put that needle down as close to that bead as possible. Um, and always try and put your thread down like in between beads. Um, and that way yeah, it should be hidden pretty well. So I'm just gonna pull the whole thing all the way through 
And so at this point, just be really careful with your threads. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put my thread, uh, put my needle and thread back up through the bottom to the top. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start over here uh, where this next petal starts. Uh, you could also start back at the bottom and you could do another full petal or you could come back this way. But what I find easiest is to just do one petal and then work my way around like that. So I'm gonna take my needle with my double thread and that's always the one that goes on top. So I'm gonna come up as close to those double to those uh, last petal beads as possible. So because I drew it on, I'm gonna come up right kind of in between or right on that line. And then I'm also almost coming up like in between two of these bead petals. And I'm just gonna pull that all the way through. And if you find that you're getting tangled in the back here and there's a bunch of thread coming out there, um, just really gently kind of pull it back out this way. And chances are it's just the thread wrapped around itself. So if you kind of really gently like pull on it, um, it should come apart and then you can um, pull through again. So at this point, we go ahead and put on more green beads or whatever color you're using. As you're working on this, uh, Alex, there's a question about uh, how many beads do you put on before you start tacking down? Someone told me not to put on more than 10. Yeah, so that is personal preference and probably like getting used to it. So I find a lot of people when they're first learning, they only like to put on a couple at a time. Um, for me, what I do is I kind of just put on a bunch and then I only wanna work with a couple at a time. So I'm just gonna move those down to the side. So my thread is still, it's just on the mat here and I'm just gonna work with these for now. And then when I'm done with these, I'm gonna take a couple more, and I'm gonna slide them up. So you can just put four on your needle at a time. Um, it is a lot more particular if you are doing single needle. Um, so there, there would be, it would be a little bit different. Um, because you have to go down before you can come back and tack. So um, for that, it would be more of like a specific number and size. Um, but for this, it doesn't really matter because you can always add on more and you can always take them off. So um, very kind of uh, relaxed, <laughs> whatever works for you. But I, I will say that when you're kind of when you're tacking them down, I like to do like maybe four to six because um, you you have to press them down with your thumb. So you don't want to be all the way back here pushing them or they'll just ball up. Right. So um, as many as you can handle, just like pushing at once. And then we continue with our up one side and down the other. And always in between the beads. So we're hiding our thread. Because you mentioned at the beginning thread wax, a few people are wondering how do you use that, uh, that material? Yeah, sure. So you can use any kind of beeswax. Like I, I know here we have, um, we have a bee farm and like they just sell little blocks of wax. But this one came in a little uh, thing that you're meant to put your thread in. So basically all you do is you just take your thread, you put it in here or just hold it onto the wax if it's not in a case. And you pull your thread through while like keeping it down so that wax is getting all over uh, the thread. And it just kind of strengthens the thread. Uh, it'll make it not fray as easily. And then it'll leave kind of like a residue of wax. So I like to just kind of pull my fingers through. And then I'll get a little bit of like extra wax there. Um, 
you don't really have to do that, but yeah, I don't always use wax. Um, I find if I'm working on something, um, like if I'm working with like a really large piece of thread, then, you know, towards the, towards the end of whatever I'm making, it'll start to fray. So I'll do that. Um, or like if I'm edging something, um, like you, you got to tug on it pretty hard. So, um, if I use wax, it'll make it less likely to break. Um, with edging too, um, a lot of people like to use fire line, which is like a thicker thread. Um, it's a lot more expensive than regular thread. Um, so you wouldn't use it for everything, but it is nice for edging because it gives you, um, a bit more confidence that it's not going to bust while you're, uh, edging your piece. And if you don't know, edging is just when we um, will connect the back piece of leather with our piece and we will um, put beads and sew all the way around so that it's uh, all connected. And there's lots of different ways to do edging, but um, we'll just do one today. With, uh, with these pieces, I like to do um, edging what we call lazy stitch. Um, so it's, you get a lot of beads on in a pretty easy way. Um, and I've also done these pins where I do just the middle and I do the lines. And, and instead of doing around the top here, I just edge it. And so it doesn't uh, it doesn't look as clean as when you're doing all the uh, all the beading around, but uh, it's a lot faster, and it still looks really lovely. While you're working on your petal, someone is wondering uh, when you finish a petal, how uh, could you repeat how you finish it? Do you tie a knot? Uh, yeah, sure. So when you get to the end, um, you take your double thread and you take your needle that has your double thread and you go straight down right here. So if you finished off here and you have nowhere else to go, you just take that double thread and you push your needle down here. You pull it all the way and all your thread out through the back. And then wherever you'd like to start beading again, you take your double thread and you just come up there. So if I wanted to start beading over here, I would take my double thread and put my needle up through here. So you don't need to tie anything off unless you run out of thread or once we're at the completion of everything. And even if you're finding that like your thread is fraying a lot, you can go ahead and just tie it off and add on a new piece of thread. That is one of the good things about beeswax. And I also find um, beeswax helps with not getting your threads tangled up as much. So we're just continuing with like up one side, down the other. And then so I'm also just going to move this to the side and show you what it looks like when that's done. So beading is pretty time consuming. Um, so it will take you a little bit to get the full um, thing done. But I'll just show you again now how to move that uh, double thread needle. So when I got to the end over here, I've already put my double uh, my needle down, but you just take the thread that's already on top. So the one that you're stitching with should always be back through the bottom. That's your single thread. And your double one is always gonna be on top unless you're moving it. So when you get to the end here, 
wherever you're done, you take your needle and put it through the back and then it's just uh, coming up the back like that. So now what I wanna do is I'm gonna do um, this petal right here. So I want to come up right here, right where that next bit of pin mark starts. So I'm gonna come up about right here. So it's right at the end of that. And I'm almost like pushing on those petal, uh, the beads on that petal, because I want it to be as close as possible because I want the beads to be pretty well touching. Um, and so even if you come off like a millimeter, then that's about a bead's length gap that you're gonna have there. So you really wanna come up like almost underneath um, that last row of beads. And then you just go ahead with um, adding on a bunch of beads onto that double thread. So we're getting, we're at about 10 minutes before the end of the event. I just wanted to let people know if you have questions, uh, it's time to put them in the Q&A. We're many here tonight, so we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible, but we not, might not get through all of them. <laughs> yeah, and if anyone has any um, like questions that didn't get answered, I encourage you to reach reach out to me afterwards. I'm always happy to help. Um, people with beading. So um, yeah, I think my, my contact information was there at the start. Um, so if you, uh, if you wanted to ask questions afterwards, I'm open to that. So um, when you get to this stage, you do the exact same thing as we did for the other petals. So you come around and around and around. And then the only thing that's a little bit different is when we get to the last one here, Instead of going all the way around, we only have one top left. So you just have to add enough beads um, to, to go through there. As you can tell, this, bead, this uh, needle has seen better days. <laughs> this happens when you work with leather, your needles bend up a lot. So yeah, so then again, this is the same um, stitch, the same step where we just come up on one side of these beads and we go down on the other side. And it doesn't matter which side, you can come up on the outside and down on the inside, or you can come up on the inside and down on the outside. It also doesn't have to be consistent. Um, if, your if your needle comes perfectly up on one side, and the next time it comes perfectly up on the next side, that's fine uh, because nobody is going to see the back anyways because we're gonna cover it up um, with leather. So it doesn't matter what the back looks like. <laughs> it only matters what the front looks like. So when you go all the way around, um, get another one here. Um, what you're gonna do is you're going to um, tie off those threads that you used. So I just make a little knot, uh, push it down to the bottom, and then cut off that piece of thread. And then the same with this double thread, we tie them both off. If they're right next to each other, you could tie them off together. And then you cut this thread off as well. And then what you're gonna wanna do is cut out the outline and leave yourself a little bit of room so don't cut down as close as you can. Um, leave a couple, couple millimeters there um, to work with. And that's because of the type of edging that we're gonna do. There are other types of edging where you wanna cut as close as you can to that. Um, but uh, that's 
not the type of entry we're doing today. So we're going to leave ourselves a little bit of room. So you're going to want to cut all the way around. Um, and then also like cut into the shape of these, uh, like in between the petals. And it doesn't have to be perfect because we are covering all of this with beads. Um, so, you know, make it uh, as nice as you can, but don't worry too much about it uh, because it is gonna be covered up. And it also doesn't really have to be too even because we're gonna use the same number of beads, which is gonna make it look perfectly even. So then you're left with something like this. Uh, and then you're gonna wanna take your other um, piece of leather. And what you can do here is you can put this down and you could either um, draw around it and just trace that shape, or you could just go ahead with your scissors um, and make that shape. Um, without drawing it on. Well, now I pre-did one because again, I'm kind of particular about it. Um, but so at this stage, what you can do um, is you can attach your pin to the back. So if you have one of those bar pins, um, which is more recommended. Um, what you can do is they have more like lines here. So you can draw the lines on and then you have two little snips. If you have something like this, um, you can kind of just stick it through. I'm probably gonna have to cut it anyways. So I'm just gonna line up where to go. I'm gonna do one little snip right there. One over here. And then you're gonna put your pin through there. And so at this stage, we can go ahead and edge, or we could also um glue these together before we start edging um which just makes it a little bit easier <laughs> to do our edging because it all stays in place so when i do that i uh use e6000 and just connect those there And then the glue does say that it takes 24 hours to dry, um, but it will hold there pretty instantly. So at this point, if you see that you've got any kind of overhang in between, you can just do a little trimming. And then the good thing about edging is that it's just one little method all the way over again. So it's not the same, but um, it is just one thing that you do over and over again. So it's pretty easy once you get the hang of it. So we're gonna take another arm's length width of thread and you can wax it if you want. And then we're gonna tie a little knot at the end. We're doing single thread, not double. And then we're going to take uh, one of our Glover needles And then we're gonna go in between our two pieces of leather and we're gonna stick our needle out and through to the top. And we're gonna come up as close to those beads as we can. If you have a little tail on your thread there, just tuck it in behind. 
And then at this point, you kind of just have to figure out how many beads it would take to go around. So I'll show you what I mean by that. I want to go from back to front all the way over. So I've got six beads on here now. I think six is probably sufficient for me. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that needle and now I'm going through both pieces of leather. And then I'm gonna pull that all the way through and then give it a good tug as always. And then you've got your edging there. So this is what we call lazy stitch because all we're doing is just putting all the beads on and giving it a tug. So you don't have to tack anything down when it comes to the edging because it's all pulled really tight. And it is just this method over and over and over again. So you just put on, use the same amount of beads every time. So I'm using six again, and then I'm pulling it all the way through. And then the beads will kind of line up together. And then so as you go, you'll have a whole lot more beading on here without actually doing a whole lot more work. And then from the back, you'll also see um, all the edging as well. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to do one more and then I'm going to show you um, how to tie it off, which is just to tie a knot. So, <laughs> but I want to at least show you. Um, so what I like to do is, so if I was at the end here, there would be another row of beads on the other side. So I take that and say this was my last row, what I do is I kind of hide in between the two rows and I go back out to the back so that my thread is coming through the back. Now in the front here, you can't really see it, but normally you kind of could. Um, but when you're going in between the rows, uh, it's, it's fine. It doesn't matter because uh, you won't be able to see it. And then at this point, you just tie off the exact same way that we did with all of our other thread. So we just tie a knot and then pull it down towards the bottom. Not everyone will tie off here. They'll kind of um, just like put it in between the beads, which is also fine. Um, so then once you tie it off, give it a snip. And then if you have a little tail left there, what you can do is use a lighter um, and then it'll kind of curl up um, and then you won't even be able to see it um, at all. So I know- Thank pretty you so much. Thank yeah, you so much, Alex. You. Sorry for cutting you off. No, no, all good. I was just gonna say it's, it's pretty repetitive. So like once you get those couple stitches down, um, you can pretty much make anything um, in any shape, whatever. Wonderful. You and <laughs> so people know because this process takes a long time. The video will be on YouTube in a few weeks. So if you want to revisit certain instructions from Alex, you can do that because it was a, a lot of information. And <laughs> um, so I want to thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for tonight's workshop. If you want to follow Alex's work, you can do so through Instagram at Alex Antol and at Bunchberry, Bunchberry Beadwork, or on her website, which is bunchberrybeadwork.ca. I also want to thank Alexia for sharing an artwork from the Ancestors Gallery with us today. And the um, uninvited exhibition is on display at the National Gallery from March 3rd to August 28th, 2023. We'd love to see what you made tonight if you want to share it with us. And we're inviting you to share it on social media using the gallery's tags that you can currently see on screen. Thank you to each of you for coming. We're sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but we really appreciated your engagement and we're wishing everyone a good evening. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.